and welcome to Blogosphere Serious Influence, the podcast all about the business side of the influencer industry. I'm Alice Audley, and I'm the founder of Blogosphere, which hopefully you've heard of. But if not, Blogosphere is a media company rooted in the world of influencers. We run events, an influencer network, and publish a nationally distributed print magazine, and now a podcast too, which I'll be presenting. If there are any questions about the influencer industry that you want answered, be sure to tweet us your suggestions. Our Twitter handle is at Blogosphere M. And if you want to learn more about influencers and the influencer industry, be sure to visit blogosphermagazine.com and invest in a subscription to our essential magazine. I'm delighted to announce that this series of Serious Influence is being exclusively sponsored by our very own tech platform, the Blogosphere Network. The Blogosphere Network is a platform where brands and influencers can feed back on what it was actually like to work with each other on campaigns. Real, qualitative data. If you'd like a demo of the service, please drop us an email at info at blogosphere.biz. That's info at blogosphere.biz. It's time to bring back the human touch to this human industry. Today on Blogosphere's Serious Influence, I'm joined by Nick Speller. Nick is head of campaigns at the aptly named influencer marketing agency, Influencer. With a career history ranging from data to digital publishing, Nick has a unique perspective on the world of influencer marketing. He also has experience of participating in brand campaigns as a blogger himself. My name's Nick Speller and I'm head of campaigns at Influencer. Let's go back actually all the way to school. What were you like at school and what were your subjects and areas of expertise? I did an A-levels degree in history, then I did a master's in international business and management. I think that's what it was called. But that was like 10, 12 years ago now. There was no Twitter. There was Facebook. Facebook arrived in the UK in my second year of uni when it was for students only. And you could only get it if you were in one of 15, 20 universities. And it didn't have a news feed. So you just had to click on people's pages and see what they're up to. And it always said is afterwards. So it would say, Nick Speller is, and then you had to write your update. So you couldn't say, did anyone see that thing last night? It didn't make sense. You always put Nick Speller is in the library or Nick Speller is blah, blah, blah. What university was that? that Uh, That was at Manchester. So Manchester got the call up. Yeah, I think there was 20 or 25 unis and then they expanded it. You had to have a university email address and then they expanded it to just everyone. Mm. And in classic social media, what has become the norm... Every change I remember getting, you know, the minute they opened the doors to everybody, everyone was in uproar. This is ridiculous. I don't want to see people that I haven't known for five, six years. I don't want to see my mum and dad, et cetera, et cetera. And you just like, you see every iteration, every time, and a new complaint. You know, the news feed came up and everyone complained about that. Then it changed. Everyone complained about that. Just the thing from day one. So was Facebook the first social platform that you were on? Yeah, begrudgingly. I didn't want to join. I didn't understand but then it wasn't really for anything because, again, no news feed. Like, what do you do with it? You just have a page that has your face on and that's it. You couldn't upload photos. You can only do a profile pic and stuff like that. So it's just like, well, what's the point? But then, you know, So we in sort of pressure. 2006 when this was happening? Yeah, it must have been, yeah, 2005, something like that, 2006. Very yeah, early. Yeah, yeah. But then, you know, peer pressure, everyone's on it, so you've got to get on it. Having seen Facebook launch and get to where it is today... Do you feel that there are repetitive cycles of people when they go onto social media and there is that resistance? Yeah, I think so. I wrote a piece about it a while ago. I feel there's like a drive amongst people who are interested in something new to jump on a social media and then it trickles through. And I feel like the first people who are on there are always the most interested, open and experimental. So, for instance, Twitter. I remember when Twitter started, everyone followed everybody. And I remember having an account where I followed because there was a ratio of how many people you could follow. But I remember hitting that and it was like, I followed three and a half thousand people and only had a hundred followers. And you're like, it's just because it's new. So you're like, oh, what's this? It's new. I'll cl- keep clicking follow and it's about all you can do. And then eventually it kind of tails off, doesn't it? You start to go, why am I following all these people? Like, who are they? Like, I followed Stephen Fry for years, like everyone did. And then I was like, but I'm not really interested in anything he does or says. So, Do you think that we've just got to that point in sort of 2018, last year, with Instagram and when everybody started noticing that, you know, followers are mm. dropping? Or... Yeah, I mean, I think there's follower fatigue, isn't there? There's definitely follower fatigue and there's definitely, I guess, a content fatigue as well, or at least people are more discerning about who they follow and why. 
and when you start on a platform it suggests people for you to follow you're going to follow them it suggests friends you're going to follow them you're going to migrate from another platform to another so when people joined instagram they first followed people they followed on twitter and it's that kind of thing but then eventually you stop following people so often and you stop exploring and looking for new people i guess just because it gets a bit dull and repetitive do you think that there is a fatigue with social having to update so many social platforms now last year we saw the brief rise of vero which yeah. lasted all of about three Ten days minutes, yeah. yeah i think yes in a way but then i feel like all the social networks are finding their niche or have found their niche and that makes it a bit easier i remember two three four years ago maybe people put the same thing on everything so it was photo on instagram then you post it on twitter then you put it on your Facebook page and actually people have tailed off on that now because they've realised that Instagram's for one thing Twitter's for another Twitter's for comment and conversation isn't it Instagram's and for meme. and meme Instagram's for showcasing your best life and your day to day stuff on stories and I guess Snapchat's for similar as well but Snapchat seems more of a game more fun more playing around do you think Snapchat has a future I think their last quarter results they sort of lost yeah, didn't they sack their head of business development who'd only been there for three months or something? Yeah, I also feel like maybe the CFO Oh, that was it. Went. Maybe it was the CFO. I don't know enough about Snapchat. I don't use it enough. I don't Do you know use it in people. any of your campaigns? Mm. Do any clients come and seek no, out Snapchat? No, not really. A year ago, yes. Now, not so much. I guess because of the limited data, you can't really understand without approaching people exactly what it is they have to offer. A lot of the brands we work with as well... I feel like people go with what they know. So you'll meet the brand manager or the marketing manager and they're on Instagram. So they know Instagram. They follow people. They look at content. They know all this stuff. They don't use Snapchat. So then their mind doesn't go to Snapchat as a marketing channel. I do want to go through how a campaign runs with you in terms of working with clients. But first of all, I feel like we've missed out on some of your chronology. So (laughs) you you finish from Manchester University, graduate from Manchester, and then... What's your sort of first job that you go into? Uh, I started working at Nielsen, AC Nielsen, it was called then. They do... Market research. Yeah, like one of the world's biggest market research companies. So I worked in FMCG, which is basically supermarket goods and supermarkets. So I was on the Tesco account. I was on the Danone account. I mean, it was interesting. It was good to work with big brands. And it it was a good grounding in data, which is obviously very important these days. But it was a lot of graphs and it was a lot of spreadsheets and it was a little bit too... I could go through a whole week without speaking to someone, like face-to-face, and for me that's kind of just makes me go a bit crazy. So after about a year I decided that was not the place for me. So that's sort of people going into the supermarkets, checking out, and then what, cross-referencing that was the data was, on credit cards and just knowing? No, it was so it was store data, so you know, how many yogurts have we sold this week, versus shopper consumer data where they put out surveys to a panel of like 25 million people or something to say why did you buy that yogurt why didn't you buy the yogurt last week what would make you buy the yogurt again and then overlaying all of that data so you could get to a, have an understanding so that tesco could go well why did we sell more carling this week and not more fosters that kind of thing and that could link in with or oh, there was an advertising campaign that was yeah. pushing that or we put it on buy one get one free or we put it on three for two or we moved it in the store so it's on the end of an aisle not the you know etc cetera, etc cetera. but i mean this was like micro micro levels of data you could go down to individual shop level and see how many individual cans of fosters they'd sold in a week that kind of thing did that give you an insight though into the minutiae of decision making in people and do you feel that that mm. lent itself to i think it more gave me an understanding of the importance of applying data to marketing, which I feel in other areas, particularly influencer marketing, has lagged behind. Every decision we took in that business, or at least our clients took, was based on the facts as they were presented in the data. The data could be looked at in different ways, could be analysed in different ways, but the data was always the founding basis for any decision. So you'd go, well, sales went up last month. Why? Let's try and understand it. Let's try and repeat that again. It wasn't so much gut feeling or people saying well as they do in influencer marketing well I want to work with this person because I like them you know Tesco never said well I want to sell Fosters because I like it they were like we're going to promote more Fosters because it sells you know better in the summer or something like that so there's always some data behind that 
But you missed people, so you wanted to get out from behind there. missed people. You missed people. Makes it sound bad. I mean, the (laughs) office was huge. It's just, I don't know, the line of work is very intensely focused on analysing data. And for that, you put your headphones on, bury yourself in your laptop and don't look up for eight hours. So Mm. it gets a bit repetitive. So I jumped over to publishing. I wanted to get more broader experience of marketing in general. And I just happened to find this job that had been created in Oxford University Press for the launch of some of their digital publications and they hadn't launched many digital publications. So that was really interesting because they were a publisher who 800 years old or something crazy and this was the first time they'd ever done something that wasn't a book. So it was kind of like taking almost a thousand years of history and then suddenly pivoting and changing and it was eye-opening to say the least. When was this? 2008, 2007, so Mm. 10 years ago. Did you feel that there was quite a lot of resistance? So they'd heard that the digital revolution was upon... No, there wasn't resistance. There was just a desire to get involved, but a complete lack of understanding of everything. So how a digital product is created, how customers want to consume digital content, how digital content should be promoted. There was a willingness. But a complete lack of understanding. But a lack of understanding, which is inevitable because... You know, they had some great people, they recruited some great teams, but they sorted out the development side really quickly. But it was the understanding of how digital content is consumed and even how it's sold. So book marketing, you build a load of hype, you put the book out, you make all your sales almost immediately and then it tails off. Online products, people want to try them for a bit and they don't see why they can't because it's online. So we can have a free trial. Okay, well, I'll look at it for 30 days, then I'll let you know. So it's a much smoother curve to the sale, which I think, confuse people for a bit do you think that that still confuses people with influence marketing today and that too many people have the idea that as soon as one instagram post goes up you're going to see a sales lift yes i think there's many things that confuse people influence marketing i feel like we're moving away from that notion that there's direct sales i still see clients and hear of clients and and hear of just other people generally the industry who are like oh we did this big campaign but we didn't suddenly see 10,000 pairs of trainers sold and you kind of think do you shop like that no so why do you expect the rest of the world to so yeah I think there's a definite lack of understanding there so after Oxford Digital Press is that when you began at Havas no I went to work for a company called Oxford Analytica who are no relation to Cambridge Analytica I was stressed because they made everyone stress that quite strongly in the last few years they were a political risk consultancy but they sold an online product so it had similarities and I was quite into global politics and things like that I was there for about two years it was interesting it was a high-end product I guess there's elements of influencer in that that the people we worked with so we had people like David Miliband was one of our contributors things like that you know we had these people who were high profile had a big pull and actually a lot of the time again similar to this industry now people just assumed that oh well we'll sign David Miliband and all of a sudden the floodgates will open and people will pour in but actually you need to understand how to use that person's influence and how to channel that influence in a way that makes sales rather than just bringing him on board and expecting people to start writing you big checks I guess that was kind of the grounding for me in terms of influencer but then I moved to London took a different job I worked in graphic design sales for a few months but I decided that I want to do my own thing Went freelance marketing consultant, as lots of people do, going around all over the place, working for lots of different small businesses, helping them try to take a product to market or you know, doing out business outreach, doing it basically as a freelance or anything I get my hands on. And this is in... Two- this must have been 2013, yeah. 2012, 2013. And it was about the time, you know, as you do, you're a freelancer, you spend more time on Twitter, you start to use social media as a tool to connect with people, go for coffee with people, try and get business. And blogging had really, really taken off by then. Influencer marketing, as we know it, I'd say hadn't. But I started writing for a friend's blog, which is quite a popular blog called Buckets and Spades, which is a men's lifestyle blog. And the more I started writing for my friend Matt, the more opportunities came our way. And we started getting invites to press trips, you know, free pairs of trainers sent to us, free bottles of alcohol, And then it started to formalise itself a bit more. So I'd drop someone an email saying, oh, well, thanks for the bottle of alcohol, and it'd be great to meet, it'd be great to chat. And then I'd go in and see them, and they'd sort of scratch their heads a bit and go, well, we're kind of experimenting with these online personalities, but we don't really know what we're doing, and we don't really know how to engage with them, and we don't really know who's out there. So I started doing a bit more work in that area, freelance consulting, and just did some work looking at female fitness influencers in the UK for a US brand 
did some stuff in the food industry, did some stuff in whiskey, and it was all a bit, you know, tiny little projects, some of them not worth very much money, some of them worth a lot more. But it was kind of just, I guess, kind of almost accidental, an accidental step into influencer marketing. Did you ever want to be an influencer yourself? Um, no, although someone in the office called me a part-time influencer the other day. Which I think was supposed to be a compliment, but I took it as as offence. <laughs> not offence, not really, but just as a, it was just an odd comment to make. I probably describe you as an influencer on the influencer market. Um, yeah, I guess so. Small scale, small time. You know, people become influencers because they create content, don't they? And I've created content about influencer marketing, and some of my content seems to resonate with people. People like it. Some people, I'm sure, dislike it. But that's grown a small following for me and it's been quite beneficial in terms of an ego boost but also in terms of bringing business to the companies I've worked for because people have seen me, read up on me and when they've had a need for influencer marketing or anyone's asked them about influencer marketing, they've gone in my direction. So that's been quite useful. I think what's also quite interesting about you specifically is that you are well known within the influencer community and I think there is a dissonance between industry and the community and so you know most people they don't really have relationships with influencers say blogosphere obviously cultivates their influencer community and we'll we'll have our chats and your name will come up yeah but i can't think of any other industry people who who would be recommended that's true do you think that that is a usp that's made you particularly employable (sighs) yeah i think so starting my career in this industry writing for a blog helped matt who runs it is based up in blackpool i'm based in london 99 percent of the opportunities for influencers are not in blackpool so go for coffees go for meetings go to events matt would get the invite and i would go along so then i'd meet influencers i'd get to know influencers i start chatting to people me and matt did quite a few trips or press trips blogger trips things like that and you just get to know people and that was before i was really working in the industry so i became friends with a lot of these people before I was in a position to then need them, if that makes sense. Did you think at that time that the industry was going to explode in quite the same way that it has done? I'd like to say yes, but probably not. Do you know, when I first started, I just didn't think about the industry. I was getting free trips and an opportunity to write, which I liked doing, and I wasn't really thinking about that. I was just doing my marketing consulting three days, four days a week and doing a bit of blogging one day a week and reaping the kind of social and lifestyle benefits that you get from that. But Um, not fiscal? No, definitely not fiscal. I mean, we went on a lot of trips, most of which weren't paid for. Interestingly, the money started to grow quite quickly. And Matt's Instagram account really exploded, which obviously helped. But we went from the early days of there was not even a question of money. Like, we wouldn't even ask for money. People would say, you know, Matt does quite a lot of fashion work, so I'd go along and take photos and they'd just be like, well, we'll pay for your train tickets to Leeds or somewhere and give you some clothes. But then slowly it started to get to the point where money started to creep into it. And then we started asking for money and people started saying yes. What time is this now? Mm, 2015, probably, I think, that kind of time. We did a couple of projects for Converse. There was one for Bombay Sapphire. And the money was given. They didn't come to us and say, would you do this? And we said, we charge money. They came to us and said, would you do this project? Here's our budget. So that was, for me, the turning point where I thought, hang on, there's actually an industry behind this. It's not just PR. And did they come with deliverables that they wanted from those campaigns? Did they know what they wanted? They thought they did, but they didn't. This is why agencies like Influencer exist. Influencer marketing isn't as straightforward as people think. There's a million and one different questions to every campaign, and a lot of which the client isn't in a position of understanding to ask properly so a good example i won't name the brand but we went up to liverpool once for a project this is you and matt me and matt matt was in blackpool i was in london but i got to Liverpool. it was about three days a really good project we really liked the concept but we kept saying but where's the brief and the client kept saying yeah yeah, i'll get your brief get your brief we didn't get a brief until the evening of the first day And by then we'd been creating content, we'd been taking photos, we'd been putting some posts up on social and we were kind of just saying to ourselves, well, this is what we think they're going to want. Luckily was what the brief said, but you're sending people away, paying them to produce content and not telling them what you want. We could have gone rogue or we could have just done nothing on that first day and then we've lost a day of the three and that was actually the first day was quite key to the content. Were you liaising with the brand director? No, that that was an agency. So that was a 
big marketing agency and having worked at them i understand the time pressures people are under and i understand that maybe the person at the agency fully understood they needed a brief but the client just didn't understand didn't care was not contactable etc so i suppose maybe it was a very small portion of the budget so. well that's what i was going to say that has been a bit of influence the story of recent years hasn't it it's kind of been kicked in the corner a little bit a client of ours said the other day influencer marketing for them so far has been the drizzle of olive oil on a salad which i thought was quite nice it's kind of like there and we know we need it but it's not a core component so far so it, that thing's always going to get neglected if it's treated in that way i think over the next couple of years we are going to see it Maybe as the cherry tomatoes. Was, <laughs> yeah, to so you're, trying to think, you're trying to think of a good bit of a salad. Yeah, and I think a lot of brands have decided that. And a lot of brands know what they're doing now. And they write good briefs and they approach the right people and they work with them in the right way. You know, two, three years ago, seems like not that long ago, but it was in influencer marketing terms quite a long time ago. A lot of brands were kind of desperate to get involved in an area of marketing that they just didn't understand. And that's led to a lot of people getting burnt, upset, disappointed, confused even further than they already were but I think it's formulating you know it's it's coming together a little bit more. I was interviewing Tom Cornish from Wavemaker earlier in this podcast and he was saying that one of his clients has committed to spend five percent of their annual budget on influencer marketing which is a great mm. and what they think will continue across the board or he hopes will continue and then in terms of the biggest budget they've been allocated to spend on influencer marketing it was 350,000. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing numbers like that from continuing the chronology when I started. So you went to Havas? Yeah, I went to Havas last. God, this, it feels in my head like it was a long, longer ago, two it's summers like, ago. It's like an episode of This Is Your Life. Yeah, it is. They're going to get me a red book at the end. Yeah, so I went to Havas. They just started to influence a team within Socialize, their social division. They were getting a lot of work from their bigger clients who were saying, look, we want to do influencer marketing. They already pay for media they already pay for creative they're just going to pay their agency to do it so i think have us in a position where they had a lot of checks ready to be written but no one to do the work so they recruited an entire team within the space of about a month where did that team come from a couple of them had come from other agencies so a couple of us came from other agencies and a couple of people were internal they just moved people you know big agencies tend to do that did you find that they were immersed in influencer marketing Yes and no. I think it was actually a very good team in terms of the balance. You had people there who had a creative background. You had people who had a strategic background. You had people who had a talent management background. And then you had people who had a pure influencer campaign running background. And that all came together quite nicely because I think it gave us something a bit different. We weren't just an experience just in running influencer campaigns. We could kind of call on all those things. And actually, again, going back to the point that a lot of clients don't necessarily know what they want, there was a need quite immediately for some of the clients who thought they knew what they wanted to actually wind it back a bit and say, okay, the strategy's all wrong here or there isn't even a strategy. You know, the creative angle is all wrong here or there isn't even a creative angle. You know, and let's think about this in more detail and more depth and actually get to the crux of what you want to achieve as a brand. We'd go to meet clients and they'd just say, we want to do influencer. That was all they'd say. You know, they'd read about it in a magazine and they were like, we've seen our competitors do influencer. We've read that doing influencer is the thing, so we should do influencer. And you're like, what does that mean? Like, it just doesn't mean anything. And and if you go down that road, you're going to create lots of nice, pretty content, but most of it probably won't tie together. And I bet none of it will deliver what you actually wanted at the end, which was sell more cups of coffee or more pairs of trainers or get more people signed up to your app or get more people to come to your holiday destination. What was the best campaign that you worked on when you were at Socialize? <laughs> I really liked the stuff we did for Domino's. We had quite a strong relationship there and we did a whole different variety of things and they were very data driven but they were also very experimental. So they wanted to do lots of different things all with good reason behind them, but it meant that for us it was a lot more interesting and exciting. So we did a lot of work. They had a partnership with Call of Duty. So we did a lot of YouTube work with gamers, which is something I'd never worked on before, but that was really interesting, really interesting insight into how people make quite a lot of money but just playing computer games in their bedroom and getting filmed. That for me was the kind of work that, yeah, we really liked doing. It was actually how I met the guys at Influencer as well because we were doing a Snapchat campaign for Domino's that had a ludicrous 48 hour turnaround and we just needed some assistance in reaching some of the creators that Domino's wanted to work with but that we didn't already have a relationship with and weren't responding to our messages. Was that quite common that you would have turnarounds like that? 48 hours, no, but tight turnarounds are something this industry seems to thrive on. 
annoyingly. Where would that deal come from in terms of the internal structure at Socialize? You have an allocated budget from one of your existing clients and then was there someone within the Socialize team that got to sign off things? Did you ever pitch to the other clients within? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's where most of the business comes from is building on those established relationships, which is what an agency like Havas is really good at doing and bringing on a company, bringing someone into one area of their kind of many armed business and then exposing it to all the other areas and growing it that way. How was that received? So if you were to go and pitch to someone that wasn't within the influencer team and say, look, I know that you're doing this campaign, this is an add-on. Was it quite easy to get those across the line? Yes, I think so. Because within agencies like Havas, there's a big push from management to constantly be innovating with your clients. So going to them and saying, look, we've run your media, your outdoor advertising campaign for 10 years, but we can also do this. And, you know, here's someone who knows what they're talking about, an influencer, and we're going to give them to you for free for two hours and they're going to explain the world to you. Now, it's that kind of thing that big agencies like to do a lot of. So it was always well received within the business if we could go and do that for someone. They could see it as added value to their clients, you know, a nice big green tick. But they didn't necessarily want to cut off a huge portion of the budget to experiment with it. No, but then I guess the beauty of influence about then and probably still is that the budgets were relatively small. So, you know, I don't know how much Domino spent on media with Havas. I probably couldn't say even if I did, but I guess the amount they were spending on influence and marketing was, again, you know, you're looking at your 5%, maybe even less. So it wasn't a huge amount that that department would be losing if they did lose it. And also it stays within the Havas pot so ultimately unless it really starts to eat away at their particular business division there isn't really a concern there and the people at the top are going to be happy because the money is being kept within the worst thing of course would be if you've got a big client i don't know let's say they spend a million and then they go well actually we're going to reduce that by 50k because we're taking that to another agency who specialize in influence better to specialize in it yourself and keep that money in-house do you think because you can test out influence marketing for not much money, and we've talked about the like olive oil analogy earlier, that people put a smaller budget towards it and then aren't happy with the results and then just write it off. Yes, that definitely happens. We are starting to see more and more clients who are now in second or third stage of influencer marketing and working with a different agency every time. So they say to us, well, we've already done an influencer campaign last year, but we weren't happy with the results. Here's why. Or at least... You know, this is why we weren't happy with them. We don't really understand why it, it I'm going to do inverted commas, you can't see it. Inverted commas mm-hmm. failed, which is quite useful because it gives you a good understanding of where they are and, and what they think of influence marketing and how they view it. And then you can construct something which you feel is going to deliver, or at least you have a better understanding of what's going to deliver. What do you think as a sort of brand to have your first dabble in influencer marketing? How much budget do you think is the sort of minimum that you can put towards it and get a good result? Because, you know, the people that are putting in, say, five grand into the influencer platforms and getting X amount of posts from lots of micro-influencers. I sometimes feel that it brands, better not to do it at all? brands make a mistake by setting a budget in a way. I feel like there needs to be more assessment of what the opportunity is out there because brands don't seem to look at that angle. They seem to go... We're going to spend 30,000 on influencer. And you're like, well, why 30? Why not 32? Why not 28? Why not 50? Why not 100? What's the opportunity out there? I've had this before. I had a, I think it was, a, it was bizarre. It's like a brand of horse race fencing come to me and say, oh, we want to do influencer marketing. I was like, but where's the opportunity? Well, there's lots of people online. I'm like, yeah, but that doesn't mean there's an opportunity for you. You know, and I've had brands come to me and say, well, we get a really good return with our Facebook ads. Uh, okay, we'll do more Facebook ads then. But we want to do influence marketing. Yeah, but you wanting to do it doesn't mean you should be doing it. It just means, again, you've decided you want to do influencer. So I feel like brands need to actually assess that and say, okay, what's the opportunity? And then they need to make the assessment, okay, what is it we want to do? You know, you can experiment with 10 grand, you can experiment with five grand, you could experiment with one influencer for 500 pounds. But I don't really know what, you know, like any kind of scientific experiment, if you're not testing a hypothesis... All you're doing is creating a nice Instagram post, which may or may not come with 200 or 1,000 likes attached to it. I don't really know what that would prove to a brand. Did you find making the move from Havas over to Influencer to a business that is 
specifically concentrating solely on influencer marketing, a pleasant mm. move in... <laughs> no? Well, I moved to a place called ShopStyle in between for a couple of months. So I had a little respite. ShopStyle, is that sort of part of like reward style? Or... They are the direct competitor of reward Ooh. style, yes. Oh. So they are a lot bigger in the US than they are in the UK. But yeah, they're an affiliate marketing platform and I moved over there from Havas. I mean, it was a great place to work, really nice, friendly people, but I was no longer focused on campaigns. I was more focused on relationship management. And actually, I quickly realised I wanted to... Too much people. Too many people, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to get back into campaigns. And at the same time, I'd been chatting with Ben and he was like, well, why don't you just come work for us? So I said, no. Okay. So can you give me an overview of what the company Influencer, it was founded obviously by Ben and Casper. And... Yeah, I mean, it's a young company. It's in you know, what was two, three years old, something like that. And it's grown incredibly in the last year from, I think when I first met Ben, he had one other employee or two other employees. So it's three of them. And now it's up to, we've got to be at 20 people now, maybe 18. I don't know. We've had two new starters last week, so I've kind of lost count. But yeah, I mean, it's an influencer dedicated business, obviously called influencer. As you said, it's kind of got a couple of YouTubers, its founders, because Josh Peters is quite involved in it as well, which is... Again, going back to your point on knowing and understanding influencers gives us a good basis to understand who's out there, how they want to be spoken to, the kind of things influencers want to do. And there's a lot of good work done to kind of engage with our immediate community and bring them on board, make them our friends and get them work, which is good. Do you think that's on a macro level, though? Because obviously Casper is a huge influencer, so has the experience of what it's like to be a huge influencer. But yeah. lots of clients are now interested in... Everyone started small. He'd have started small at a different time, but I think he has that understanding. And I think a lot of the things are still the same. The same frustrations, be you big and small, the same complications when it comes to brand deals, the same lack of understanding on both sides of what each party can bring and what each party should be doing. So, yeah, I think we're getting into an age now where some of the influencers out there have become so large that they're actually operating on a different level. I saw an influencer posting the other day about how she's now got a lawyer and an accountant and a PA and a, and you just think, yeah, I mean, brilliant. She's obviously done incredibly well, but it doesn't mean her learnings along the way are any less valid, but her learnings going forward are going to be different from someone who's got... 12,000 followers and is juggling writing a blog with having a full-time job or studying at university. So I think it's kind of getting into an interesting space in that regard. And your role at Influencer is head of campaigns. Yes. So that means I manage the account management team. So, so we're we, going out to land the deals? No, no. So we deliver the campaigns. Okay. We have a sales team who I'm kind of almost laughing because I got on the tube to come here and then realised that we were supposed to be having our team meeting. <laughs> so I had to message everyone on WhatsApp saying, oh, I'm not in the office. Do you have to do a team meeting without me? Essentially, the company's, I was going to say split in two, it makes it sound like we're opposing sides, but we have a sales team and we have the account management team. Sales team build relationships with brands, go and meet brands, talk to brands, meet agencies, big marketing agencies, talk to big marketing agencies and bring us, the campaigns team, the opportunity to do work so they'll bring us a brief or sometimes they'll bring us a, a fully fledged deal and then we get on and do it and we have our own platform where we deliver the campaign so we can contact influencers through it we can look them up we can look at their statistics we can get them to send us content we can send them briefs we can manage payments etc all through one nice neat space do you have a feedback to the sales team and, and say look i've seen this brand doing quite a lot of activity it would be good for you to reach out to them. Occasionally, but they're so on it, I don't need to. That's what they do. They're always passing around leads between each other because they all have different industries to go after. So they'll say, oh, we've seen such and such is doing more influencer marketing. Once you've seen someone's doing a lot of influencer marketing, it's actually a bit useless because generally means they've signed up with an agency or they're doing it in-house, but it gives you an understanding of which industries are kind of building up their influencer work. And also, I guess if you see a brand doing influencer today and they weren't doing it yesterday in a year's time or so their contract might be up so it's a good opportunity to go and speak to them and say we'd like to have a go at doing this we'd like to put a proposition in front of you etc what's the best fully fledged deal that lands on your desk what does that look like definitely one that with a client we've worked with before they'll know what it is we want to know if that makes sense so first deal with a client generally involves a lot of questions a lot of back and forth and them going oh we didn't think of that or we didn't think of that the second deal, the third deal, they'll go, oh, I know you want the answer to X, Y, Z, so we got that already. So that's the kind of stuff that's good. I mean, the Can you best... give an example, sorry, of yeah, some yeah. of those like, questions? So like, it's a firm understanding of who the audience is. 
a firm understanding of who the influencers might be. One thing I'm always keen to push is that you know, the influencer you want to work with might not necessarily be the target audience you want to deliver to. So brands sometimes get fixated on that. They're like, well, we're after this demographic, therefore the person must be this demographic too. And I'm like, well, it doesn't necessarily follow, does it? We if, want to change some people's opinions as well, so you can't just well, exactly, to the choir. Well, exactly. If you said we want to get lots of unhealthy people in our gym... Does that mean you don't work with a fitness influencer? Or maybe it does mean you work with a fitness influencer because their audience are aspiring to be fit. It's strange to just go, we want to appeal to people who never go to the gym, so we'll use someone who never goes to the gym because that wouldn't make much sense if you're a gym and unless you're going to set them through a training program or something, I don't know. It's those kind of things. It's stuff like, are there any key dates? That's something that comes up. And client will say no, and you'll say really? And they'll go, oh, well, we are launching this big campaign on January the 1st or whatever dates are coming up soon and you go okay well would you want the content to go out then oh yeah of course and you're like you hadn't said that and that's the kind of hiccup that you can get in a campaign where you start the campaign and then halfway through the client goes oh and by the way dot 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 things like freebies are quite an interesting one so you'll work with a client and they have a product and you'll say okay what gifting budget do you allow and they go oh we didn't think of that you know that's something you need to think of because if we say to influencers let's say you're an electronics brand they want you to feature one of their TVs and they turn around and say, well, I want the £10,000 telly. Are you going to give them the £10,000 telly or are you going to say, no, there's a limit on gifting to £1,500 or something? You know, those kind of basics that we have to go over time after time. Do you ever get a fully fledged deal that lands and you panic because there's been so many deliverables promised and the budget's not actually big enough? That has happened in every job I've worked in in influencer marketing. I mean, it's something that generally comes, I mean, it happened at Havas a couple of times where people had sold stuff without a full understanding of the capabilities. And sometimes it will come around, and I'm thinking of a campaign that was actually, yeah, was one of my last ones at Havas. It came around because the deal had been discussed for two years and the deliverables had never changed. And obviously pricing changes and people do become more expensive. Things become more expensive. So to say, well, we put these figures together based on 2016 or 2017 or whenever it was and then to try and deliver it two years later it's just not going to work so but you don't have to do that necessarily at influencer because it's a more agile business yes and i guess and it's only two years old <laughs> it's only two years old so that helps i think instagram stories is a very interesting one for that as is a good example you know instagram stories when that came along people seem to just chuck them in for free or for like you know Oh, I'll do an Instagram post for a thousand pounds. I'll do the story for 50 quid because it was just quick and easy. But actually, as influencers have started to understand the value of that, they've started to price accordingly. And a lot of brands have said, well, hang on, six months ago, we paid nothing to get three Instagram stories. Now you're saying it's this much money. You so got your swipe up links. Well, exactly. And I guess that's where partly where it's come from. But also influencers can turn around to their statistics and say, well, actually, my reach on my Instagram post is only a third of what it is on my stories because my audience are so engaged and love my stories so much. So that's where they see the value and that's what brands should be paying for. But obviously, if six months ago, the same person charged a lot less for their stories, the brand's going to be questioning that. And if you'd set up any deals in the kind of meantime while that's changing based on old assumptions that's gonna come unstuck in the future do you have a minimum campaign budget that under which you wouldn't touch yes and no we tend to say to people ten thousand pounds i guess but to be honest it just totally depends on the situation and circumstance and i don't really like the money side of things i like working on interesting and fun campaigns and if a new brand comes along and they don't have much money but they've got an interesting and fun campaign that i think we can deliver and deliver well then i wouldn't see any reason why we wouldn't do it as long as we weren't basically spending our own money to mm. deliver it as long as the budget was good enough that we could deliver something of value then i don't see why we wouldn't do it this industry is a balance between the reach of a piece of content and the impact of a piece of content if you drop the budget too low you're going to damage both because you're just not going to be able to pay to reach the number of people you want to reach and you're not going to be able to pay for the level of quality and the content that is necessary to actually have an impact on the people you do reach. So there definitely is a base level, but I'm not entirely sure that that's one specific number for all industries, for all brands forevermore. I think that has to be adaptable. I know that you don't specifically like talking about money, but what's <laughs> the like biggest budget that you've had that you can play with? I guess... That's difficult to answer because that gets more into the longevity of uh, deals. So, well, actually, talk to me about the longevity of, of deals as well. In a typical campaign, what is it sort of a, a month to a year? 
So most campaigns we work on will be between one and three months, I would say. Getting to the annual deals is, I guess, the goal of any agency business anywhere. But those deals aren't as regular in influencer marketing as they seem to be in other areas of marketing. Do you think that it will become more regular, though? Do you think I think so, yeah. Ben and I were actually chatting about this this morning. I think we're going to get to a stage where clients say, again, it kind of comes down to the notion of why have you decided there's only one campaign? Why have you decided it's only a month? I know brands obviously have their peak sales time and they want to back that up with a certain level of marketing. But over the course of the year, it makes much more sense to spread your influencer budget out and target those specific times when you need to bring in sales, not just go, this is the January campaign. That just seems a bit Do you think arbitrary. this is an, an age problem, though, actually, that this industry faces, that you've got a decade of people being immersed in it who are probably late 20s, early 30s, so have a relative position of seniority but actually when you get into the bigger agencies, it's the people in their 40s and 50s that don't necessarily know, so aren't allocating that budget. So as we grow and people get more senior, then yeah. we'll be in a better position anyway. I think that's going to happen with digital marketing all over and influencer marketing is the newest part of that, in my view. So I think as we go through the years, people with experience in these fields will become more senior and then they'll have a greater understanding. Although having said that, what comes next they probably won't have an understanding of so you'll probably end up with them acing influencer marketing and screwing up whatever comes next so yeah i definitely think that that's true and i saw it have asked quite a bit you know a lot of that business is based on media buying and they were always trying to fit influencer marketing into media buying because that's the language they're used to that's the skills and experience they have and that a senior level both client and agency, that's what they understand. So you get these giant spreadsheets that say, this is when we're going to do out of home. This is when we're going to do the TV spot. This is when we're going to really push high on Facebook spend. And then you had influencer on like there. tacked on at the end. Yeah, it was always at the bottom, always at the bottom because it's the smallest one. And they go, oh, we're going to do £10,000 of influencer. And then you put the numbers in as best you could and they go, well, this is ridiculous. You know, look at our CPM is ludicrously high for influencer. Why are we doing that? That's when you realise there's a lack of understanding and you're never going to win. <laughs> you mentioned earlier about the cost increasing on Instagram stories and Instagram is your area that you're probably best known in on, across LinkedIn with fake followers, etc. Yeah, I'm not going to yeah. go down the rabbit hole <laughs> yeah, of fake followers just that. yet. <laughs> but I did want to talk to you about the social platforms that clients are coming in. Obviously, lots of them are on Instagram now. Yeah. And so that seems to definitely have been last year everything was about Instagram. We sort of saw the, the move a bit away from YouTube and to concentrate on Instagram. Yeah. Do you think that in 2019, we're actually going to reach peak Instagram? I think we'll reach it one day. Not sure if it'll be 2019. I'm not sure there are any other social networks out there that they can copy. That's going to be their issue. That's where they might get a bit stagnant. I'm not sure. I mean, I'm a big fan of Instagram, even though I moan about it a lot, as do many other people. And the way that it works as an entity frustrates me a lot of the time. And their lack of transparency definitely frustrates me. But ultimately, I think it is the best social platform out there for a lot of brands in the way they want to engage with people. What is the way that they want to engage with people? Well, OK, not the way they want to, the way they should engage with people. You know, Instagram's a highly visual social network that allows you to cultivate a brand, cultivate an image and actually create something aspirational and in the best way of doing it, generally attainable. That's how I see it should be used. A lot of brands want to use it for competitions or they want to talk to people or they want people to create content and you just think, I don't think you're using it in the correct way in that regard. So do you think with Instagram, it's the best place for brand sentiment, which then obviously does lead to sales in a nice fluid one, but for actual sales and tracking that YouTube is probably a better place um, for that? I guess with Swipe Up, that's helped drive direct sales. I know a lot of people who use affiliate links who've told me that Instagram stories is where they make all their money. So it does work. I think YouTube has historically been better at that. And Twitter's underrated in that area, I think. I've spoke to some people in the affiliate world who say they make a sizable portion of their money from Twitter. And their tweets will never get retweeted and never get favorited, but people click on them and people then go through to buy. So actually, particularly when you're looking at the way that affiliate marketing works, Twitter, you tend i guess more than instagram to use on a desktop so when you click the link it will open it 
in another window, another browser, and it will drop the cookie in there. So then if you go back to your computer and do some shopping, that cookie gets registered and the person whose link you clicked on makes the money. Instagram, swipe up, the browser, as far as I'm aware and understand, is standalone. So you're never logged into anything. And if a cookie gets dropped, it then gets taken away the next time you log out. So there's less opportunity to make those sales, or at least, sorry, to register those sales, which is obviously how brands measure how effective you are at making them. As you said, with peak Instagram, I'm not sure I could put that prediction in, but I can't see anything on the horizon that's going to challenge it. But then if I knew what was going to challenge it, I'd probably be making it myself. Do you think that we are going to see more affiliate marketing this year? Because I suppose when it was right back to the beginning, when blogs were absolutely huge, affiliate marketing was a good portion of that. And now they're obviously networks, one of which that you worked yeah. at. In Asia, it's... It's kind of, pretty large. It's all affiliate marketing and they're all blogging on one platform as opposed to their own. Yeah, I think affiliate marketing will get bigger. Amazon are making moves into that space and have been for a couple of years and that's probably going to bring a lot of power with it. I think, again, fatigue is the risk, particularly if you're the content creator. I think with affiliate marketing, it's something that I feel like you can only make money from it once you've made money from it. I think it's a very hard thing to plan that one day you're going to be this big affiliate marketing person. It's kind of the sort of thing you can use once you've made it big. I mean, obviously, if you use it on the way to making it big, that's useful. But I don't think you could plan it as a business and say, I'm going to make this much from it. Because I think audiences are going to start getting bored. At the minute, you know, when I was working at ShopStyle for only two months, you could see a number of very big bloggers doing very, very well out of affiliate marketing. But not all of them were using it, not all the time. If that starts to become the norm, the audience will get bored because they're not enjoying the content. They're just being sold to continuously. And I think that becomes a bit dull for them, particularly when it's affiliate, particularly on Instagram, because it tends just to be pictures from the catalog with a swipe up link included and in the stories. And the people really like that. It's not very insightful. It's not very interesting. Eventually, you're just going to go, oh, I can't be bothered and stop following that person or stop looking at their content. I've spoken to a few influencers and they quite like the affiliate links as a subsidiary to their main yeah, income of yeah. brand deals because it means that you don't have to accept all of the brand deals. Yeah, and this is the thing we said at ShopStyle to a lot of bloggers or influencers. Why would I do this? And he said, well, you know, you're never going to become rich from this necessarily, but this could pay your web hosting fees. This could get you an extra holiday. Yeah, this could get you a couple of hundred pounds. Who's going to say no to a couple of hundred pounds? And it's not really much work to what you're already doing. Now, that's the way affiliate marketing tends to work the best is when it's a natural inclusion, not you sitting down and going, okay, today I'm going to do affiliate marketing because I think that probably leads itself to you picking and choosing things just because you want to make money from them, not because you actually think your audience are interested in them. There has been a news story recently that it was a New York marketing agency, Captive 8, I believe, that said that brands had wasted $200 million on influencer marketing to fake influencers, so £157 million. Have you had any kind of conversations with your clients about fake followers and is that something that you find that you have to reassure them and I know that you're a <laughs> yeah that's a... something I talk about continuously actually I haven't talked about it much this year maybe we've hit peak fake followers I don't know I mean clients always want reassurance they're not wasting money what measures do you kind of go um, to, to ensure that the influences that you're working with on your campaigns are I'm not sure I want to go into them in detail mainly because Ben would probably kill me but also because I'd probably just bore everybody but no, this is not boring <laughs> don't evade the question it is there's serious a, influence there's a significant <laughs> level of due diligence we undertake and we look at a number of different sources of information I mean back in the day the only thing I checked was Social Blade Social Blade's now a bit more difficult to use but it does have some really good historic stuff we use two other platforms to try and assess influencer activity and then to be honest a lot of the time on top of that we use some gut feeling but all no, of, i think that's really good i think yeah. you know, it's human industry yeah it is a human industry and for all of social chains chat about coming up with the one platform to kill all the fraud it's just not possible they said they were going to detect these suspicious patterns but you know fraud is all about hiding and it's always going to be one step ahead you know that's what happens so if you start looking for smooth curves fraudsters start smoothing curves people who sell fake followers are going to say okay well i'll sell you 10 a day 12 a day 14 a day i'll sell you a package where you get we'll actually take some followers away from you there because that will look more realistic you know you're going to start to see that creeping in so you do need that intuition and i feel like 
we can only ever push that as far as the technology will allow us to go before the intuition has to kick in. And even after the intuition, I'm sure, you know, I've worked with people before where I'm just thinking, I cannot prove anything is wrong with them at all. I just don't feel that they're legitimate. But then if you don't have the proof, if you don't have the evidence, you know, if you've got a good relationship with your client, you can turn around and say, look, I just don't think we should use this person because I, I haven't got a good feeling about them. But the client might say, well, as long, and if you can't prove it, then we will go with them because they look legit and they look like the kind of person we should be working with. So, so is it on the, the flip side, you've got brands working with fraudulent influencers, but then you've got authentic influencers promoting fraudulent brands exactly <laughs> which brings me neatly on to the recent netflix documentary about fire festival where i think kendall jenner was paid two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to promote this festival and an array of other influencers mm. were speaking to influencers how important is it for them to do their due diligence when working with brands well i mean it's as important as the reverse really isn't it I feel like with influencers get a bad rep a lot of the time for a lot of different reasons. And I actually have a lot of sympathy with a lot of influencers for the things that happen to them, particularly because a lot of them, this is accidental. I'm sure people do now sit down and say, I want to be an influencer. But a lot of the people who got where they are today never did that. They sat down and went, I like writing. I like taking photos. I like being online. And they used that and they grew a following. And before they knew it, their brand's knocking at their door, offering them money. And I think some of them never realise that their value isn't based on their following as a number. It's based on their validity as a brand. And anything they do to damage that brand is going to hurt them financially, personally, emotionally, mentally in the future. So they do need to start saying, OK, is this vitamin company legitimate? Is this festival legitimate? What do I know about this? And if the question is, I don't know anything about it, then why are they advertising it? That That's part of the problem. Do you think there's enough guidance out there in that vein for influencers? No, but then I'm not sure why there should be or would be. That's one of the gripes I sometimes have with influencers is you get a lot of people in the community thinking as if someone else should be helping them. And I'm like, you're not at school anymore. You know, there isn't a teacher to go to and ask what's right and what's wrong. You're running a business and you're promoting your brand and you're trying to build an audience and better engage that audience, make money from it. You have a responsibility to understand how you can be damaged or how you can damage other people, understand the rules and the regulations and things like that. And if you're not prepared to do all those things, then you have to accept the consequences of what might happen to you if you don't, which is you work for a brand who are fraudulent or you promote something in a way that shouldn't be promoted or you don't declare your adverts when you should be you know it's those kind of things that i think a lot of people need to kind of wise up and realize and think about and if they're not prepared to do that then then don't take the money and don't do the work do you think there's enough communication on the industry side between agency to agency and there are obviously a lot of influencer talent managements that have cropped up in the past it's a very busy market mm, now yeah, um, yeah. like the last kind of two three years there have just been a lot of new companies starting out do you think that there is a place in the future for everybody or do you think we're going to see some consolidation what are your predictions for the industry every industry tends to do that doesn't it goes kind of wild west everyone's running around with spades and shovels looking for gold making gold grabbing fake gold not making any gold and then you start to see it happen you know you'll see the big media agencies the big marketing agencies start to purchase the smaller more successful influencer focused agencies they'll try and poach their staff if they can't do that then they'll just go you know what you know kind of wpp martin sorrell style you go 25 million quid we'll just buy them we'll just buy them their contracts their people everything so you'll start to see some of that i think you know was it brand new i don't want to speak out of turn it might not have been them Brand new IO. Did they go bust? I yeah. don't know. Sorry, I don't. Oh yeah. I should keep up more with industry things. So, I don't. Well, we had that in series one of the the podcast. Okay. So yeah, brand new IO was a payment system that Mediacom used. Mediacom did not own brand new IO, and that okay. is what was going across Twitter. So we clarified uh, that. Okay. But it went into. I mean, yeah, exactly. Don't want to speak out of turn here and slander, but I believe it went into. It didn't close down, but there were six months where it said that if anyone did a campaign from January the 1st to June the 1st, they're not going to get paid, but okay. we're still running. So, yeah. Okay. okay, so there's already been casualties, shall we say, along the way. And we had Mode and Defy. Yeah, 
And I think there will be more. I think there will be mergers and there will be, I think there'll be specialisms as well. I feel like at the minute it's a kind of, again, it's do influencer. We do it, you know, influencer, we do influencer. Who knows in three years time, we might say, well, we only do Instagram influencer campaigns. I mean, people like Takumi own do, as far as I know, or did only do Instagram. You now you've got, is it fame bit? They got bought by YouTube, by Google. They only do YouTube campaigns as far as I'm aware. And then there's another group of guys whose name escapes me who only do Snapchat. So it's like, you are going to start to see that. And I think we'll see it not just across platforms, but we'll see it within niches. So we'll get people saying, well, we only do, you know, I don't know, fashion influencers, female fashion influencers aged between 20 and 25. That's the only people we ever work with. So if you're a brand in that field, you come to us and we're the experts in that area. Because I think as the industry grows, that will become you know, more of a niche. As I said, I don't have much experience in the gaming sector. So if a brand came specifically to me, I mean, we've got people at Influence who are, so it's fine. But if they came specifically to me, if I was a freelancer, I'd have to say, well, look, you better off going somewhere else. So it's that kind of thing that I think we will start to see more of. I do think as well that you've mentioned the marketplaces there, that as a defence mechanism, you know, you can have a social platform that's suddenly popular what will last is actually relationships Mm. so you can have a whole roster of loads of micro influencers but i feel like the platforms are actually then developing an upper tier where they do want to have squads and that we're kind of seeing everyone wants to now realize that direct relationships are pretty important i think direct relationships in this industry have always been important i think when business jumped on board the first thing business wants to do is scale everything it wants to make everything efficient it wants to make everything effective it wants to get to a stage where you can hand over the reins of your hundred thousand pound influencer campaign to a junior account manager who never speaks to an influencer never speaks to the client receives the instructions administers the instructions the influencers do their job properly and money pours in at the other end, you know, £110,000 for every £100,000 spent. And I think influencer marketing is proving that it doesn't conform to that model because it's too many things layered into one another and it is too many variables and it is too people focused. I know people who I've worked on with campaigns who didn't respond to a single email from us until I sent them a DM on Instagram because I know them and then they're like, oh yeah, okay, I'll get involved because I know you and because I trust you. So without that link, those people wouldn't have been involved in that campaign. No no amount of efficiency software would have removed that. But of course, business is used to work in an industry where it's not this plethora of individuals at the bottom, it's a series of other companies. So if you want to get a billboard up, you talk to one of what, two, three companies in the world, you know, they're ready and waiting to take your money for a billboard. Influencers aren't necessarily ready and waiting to take your money for a campaign just because you want them involved. And that's something that brands often struggle with. An influencer says no, and they're like, well, what do you mean no? They're a business, they should say yes. It's like going into a shop and saying, can I have a Cabbage chocolate bar and the guy goes no because I can't be bothered to sell it to you today it's like well but what I'm here with my money and I want to buy it so brands struggle with that you know I've had it with quite a few fashion brands in the past where fashion brands have said well we want to work with these people and I've gone to these people and they said well I would work with that brand and then the brand said well we want to push our velvet lined suit jacket and that's what we want everyone to wear and three of the influencers have turned around and gone no not going to do it because that's not what I do it's not my style and the brand's gone but we're paying you this is what you're going to do and the influencer's like well no that's not how this works you're not just buying a space on my Instagram you're buying part of me essentially and my creativity my look my style and that's going to suffer if I wear your clothes so and also their history and sort of evolution and, and that yeah now I was talking the other day it's something we've been discussing I don't know I always get fixated on individual words and carry them on for ages we've been talking about narrative now, with influencers, narrative is key. You know, you don't just follow an influencer and love them the second you see them. You kind of get involved in their life in a way. And I think that's where Instagram's done really well with the balance between stories and posts. You know, people see these influencers and they start to learn what they're doing and they learn their catchphrases and they learn their gym routines and they know they're going to go to Miami next week or they know they're going on a trip to Sheffield and they offer them some advice on where they should go and where they should drink coffee and it's all kind of a it's a multi-layered narrative and brands think they can just come in and go right now you're going to advertise my brand of popcorn and you're like where does that fit in the narrative if it doesn't fit in the narrative the returns you know you might get a load of likes for it but the real returns are going to be minimal it interferes with that passage of time that people want to observe with the people they follow. So I think it's, you know, it's that kind of stuff that brands need to understand and sometimes really struggle with. And finally, what are your personal goals 
for the rest of this year in, in career, goals. yeah, like career was, and also you have these team meetings. Where does influencer? Where's that trajectory? My personal goals are just I'm going to continue to work with all of our great clients and more clients. Do you have a, a client that could be listening to the podcast <laughs> that, that you wants want to, to work, work with? No, I want to work with people who want to work in this space in a similar way to the way I see it. I want this industry to become more creative because I feel it's becoming bland. That's my biggest kind of worry and fear at the minute is that this industry got to where it was because there are a lot of people out there who are incredibly creative, be it written, visual, stylistically, whatever. And they grew an audience, and they grew a following and people were influenced by them for that. And I think brands to a certain extent have pushed people to be grey because they want to play it safe and they want to play it conservative. And a lot of influencers are echoing that by thinking, well, I won't put up something daring this week because it might scupper a brand deal. So I'll do something grey. And I want to get away from that. I want brands to come to us, an influencer, and say, we want to do something interesting, innovative and exciting. That's the kind of campaigns we want to work on. Or at least they're the kind of campaigns I want to work on. So they're my personal goals. I guess... My personal goals also chime in with the businesses. Now, I want to see the business grow. There's so many great people out there in this industry doing great work, and I'd love for us to employ more of them. We already employ some of them, but it'd be great to employ more of them as we get more work on board, more projects, more campaigns, because I think we will just start to do better and better things. And it would be nice at the end of next year, as we did at the end of this year, to sit down with an even greater storyboard of all of the campaigns we've worked on and feel proud about that. A big thanks to Nick for coming on the show. You've been listening to Blogosphere Serious Influence with me, Alice Audley. Be sure to check out blogosphere-magazine.com for influencer industry updates. And why not treat yourself to a magazine subscription whilst you're there? <laughs>